So welcome everybody, I'm Mark Levecki. I am the uh, editor at large for Providence Magazine, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. And I am the McDonald Visiting Scholar here at the University of Oxford at the McDonald Center for Theology, Ethics, and Public Life. And I am with Sal David, who is a professor at the University of Buckingham, a military, his, military historian, broadcaster, and author of numerous critically acclaimed books, both fiction and nonfiction. I think all that's correct. That's right. Welcome, Sal. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Mark. Very nice to be here. Can you, uh, before we get into your book, and we're going to be talking about uh, your latest book, Crucible of Hell, and I wish I could hold up a copy of it, but I've only got it on Kindle. So I don't know if you've got a copy of it. We'll put a, a link to it in our program notes, <laughs> but uh, just to show it off, uh, it I don't is. know if a book about war can have a beautiful cover, but it's, it's, it's well designed and, and quite lovely. Before we jump into a conversation about that, can you just say something about who you are, what you do, why you do what you do, that sort of thing? Yeah, sure. I mean, the story began many, many years ago, actually, as a teenager, when I was asked by a very good friend of mine what I planned to do with the rest of my life. And I said, <laughs> well, I was going to write history. And right. she said, to me, well, that's not really a job. You know, what are you going to do to make a living? Um, I, I, I genuinely thought when I started out in my mid-twenties, when I wrote my first book, that that's all I'd end up doing. As you've already said, I'm now a professor of military history. And I think the two go quite nicely hand in hand, actually. Teaching, um, the academic research, uh, but also with the opportunity so that I don't teach full time, enough opportunity to keep my my books going and I'm now well you know it's slightly embarrassing to have to admit Mark but I've almost lost count but I'm definitely into the teens probably the mid-teens for books yeah. now it's yeah. been a lot of fun and it's been a great learning curve I think my writing's changed very much over the years and, and I hope for the better well that's brilliant so, so a quick ad hoc question because all our listeners who are in the profession that we're in are going to now be asking themselves how does he do it so how have you done it? What is your what is your writing style? What is your writing regime? Well, I like to uh, I like to get all the research done first. I like to get a feel of the places I'm I'm writing about. I like to go and walk the ground. If it, if in this uh -huh. case it's the story of a campaign or a battle, I like to meet as many people as I can who are involved in the stories. But of course, in the case of the 19th century, some of my books are set in the 19th century. Right. You're not going to be able to do that. So you've got to rely on documents. I think really the heart of all my books has been the human story, and it's, mm -hmm. it's very much at the heart of, of Crucible of Hell. That's what right. does it mean to be a human being and uh, caught up in the maelstrom of conflict? It, it's always fascinated me, it's intrigued me. I was never a, a, a soldier myself. I considered it briefly. Mm -hmm. I somehow regret, funnily enough, that we don't still have the equivalent of national service, um, right. so that you could at least get an experience of military life without making it your professional Career. But that aside, I spent a lot of my time talking to, studying, and writing about war and the military, and, and hopefully I've got some insight, insights as a result of that. Yeah, I think that's, that's very clear, and we'll, we'll prove that in just a moment. Um, why don't we jump into it? Uh, the book, as we've said, is Crucible of Hell. It's about the Battle of Okinawa. Uh, in it, at one point, you say that the campaign would last 83 blood-soaked days and would plumb the depths of savagery. Now, many of our viewers uh, will know something about the Battle of Okinawa, uh, but many will know very little. Um, can you set the stage for us? Uh, uh, what are the key facts? What's essential to know about the Battle of Okinawa? Well, it's important to know that uh, nobody, when the battle was planned and certainly when it was being fought, realized what was gonna happen next. It's, it's an important point to make, Mark, as you know, about all periods of history, but particularly this one, because there's uh, there's very much a sense that as the war began, as the war in Europe ended halfway through the battle, and I'll talk about the parameters of the battle in a second, um, you know, it was very much going to be the end game of the Second World War. Nobody knew that at the time, and that's a very important uh, point to make at this mm. stage. So what were they doing in Okinawa? Well, it was an island 400 miles to the south of the Japanese home islands. It was actually part of the Japanese archipelago in the sense that it was the most southerly of the 47 prefectures, so it was part of the administrative whole of Japan, um, they were going to use it really as a final staging point, point before the invasion of Japan proper, which was planned for later in the year and also the spring of 1946. So getting back to my earlier point, they didn't know what was going to happen next. 
it's really the culmination of a two-pronged axis of advance, one coming through the Central Pacific, that was Admiral Nimitz's forces, and then MacArthur's forces coming up from New Guinea and through Philippines, and they both meet, uh, these two axes, axes of advance meet on Okinawa. So why, you know, why, why is the battle so crucially important? Well, one, because as I've already explained, it's gonna be used as this launch point. It's the first time they get to a sizable part of J Japan proper. Mm. Um, but also the, it, it's really an opportunity to, to test out, I suppose, the, 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 um, the depth and the strength of Japanese defenses, because what they're gonna find on Okinawa, they're pretty sure is gonna be multiplied when they get to Japan proper. So the battle begins on the 1st of April. It lasts, as you say, for 83 blood-soaked days. Um, and during the course of that time, uh, really the American servicemen and of course their Japanese opponents go through, you know, as I say, the title of the book is The Crucible of Hell, but not just for them. It's also for the, um, the Okinawa, the poor Okinawan civilians right. who were caught up in the maelstrom. Why was the battle so tough? Because the Japanese have been perfecting their methods of defense over the previous uh, year or two, and they'd realized that actually, if you don't have firepower, which the Allies generally had the advantage of at this point, they, they, they had firepower both from the air and from the sea, you needed to build very deep, very effective defenses. And that's what they did on Okinawa, 60 miles of underground interconnected, interlocking fields of fire. I mean, a, a veritable killing ground was created, Mark. Right. And it was up to the um, uh, American troops to try and find their way through it. Interestingly, when they first land on the 1st of April, uh, there's no opposition. And, they're, and they're, they're kind of fooled into thinking this means that it might be easy. But of course, what had actually happened is that the Japanese had made a deliberate decision not to oppose them on the beaches, which is what they're generally used in previous mm -hmm. combat uh, in Iwo Jima and also Peleliu and wait for them in these prepared positions. And as a result of that, uh, the battle becomes incredibly attritional and it's effectively a meat grinder. Right. So that's the grim big picture. And it's a big picture that you tell very well. Uh, but doing good history, you also get into the granular details uh, and you recognize that, that any big event in history is made up of lots of smaller events, lots of personalities and the like. Um, for instance, you take quite a bit of time uh, and care to tell a story probably a about a probable controversial decision made by the American Ground Force Commander General Buckner uh, to refuse the advice of subordinates uh, to order a second landing behind the Japanese defenses in late April of 1945. Um, can you say more about that? Why is that a significant story to tell? Did he make a mistake? I think he probably did make a mistake. I mean, of course, you know, with the, with the benefit of hindsight, we can say we know what happened next and what happened next was tragic uh, for, for all concerned. But, but even with that notwithstanding, uh, we, we have to accept the possibility, the counterfactual possibility of a second landing having some effect. And there is some evidence that it might have had some effect. And, and that evidence comes from the Japanese themselves. The, the chief um, staff officer, really the architect behind the uh, defense on on the island not the commanding general himself but his chief of staff officer wrote later that their main concern was a landing by uh, american troops behind their formidable positions and that they had actually detached a, a reasonable chunk of their forces to meet that threat now by the end of april so many casualties uh, had the japanese taken that they actually moved the bulk of those forces that were to be used to um, uh, repulse any second landing and fed them into the front line, not least because they were planning a, an offensive, a very ill-advised offensive their, of their own. And I think there's strong evidence, certainly from the Japanese side, that a second landing would have had a big effect. Buckner himself was incredibly inexperienced. Uh, oddly enough, at the stage of the war, you would have thought most commanding generals of armies would have had a lot of experience. He had not. He was in the Alaska command and really had fallen into this job. It probably should have gone to a much more experienced mm -hmm. Marine general who, uh, you know, who had seen combat in, in the Pacific. And all I, all I can say, we don't know for sure, Mark, but all I can say about the decision not to put a Marine in command was partly political. There was some bad blood between the Marines, the Navy in general, and the Army at this stage. And th there was very much a feeling that a major campaign on an island of this size really should be Army-led. Uh, and, and that's exactly what happened. So Buckner 
he, he takes the advice of his subordinates who, uh, when I say subordinates, his staff. So he's being advised by some of his divisional generals to, to launch this attack. He asks his right. staff and his staff actually say, we think as staff officers often do, they find out all the reasons why it won't work, which is okay. logistically getting off the beaches, can we resupply them? And instead of making the decision himself, he allows them to make the decision for him. And I think it was a mistake we will never know for sure, mm -hmm. but it would have put extra pressure on the Japanese uh, defensive uh, positions. And one thing is absolutely for certain, they wouldn't have known where that landing was going to come, and they certainly didn't have anything like as effective defenses in place in the south of the island to meet it. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. You, t you touch on the political versus maybe operational tensions, just in the, in the elevation of Buckner to the post that he had. Uh, are, are there other tensions as well? Were there interbranch rivalries or at least clashes of culture between the U.S. Army and the Navy and Marine Corps? Between, as you've, you've touched on with Buckner, uh, a lack of experience on the one hand, and not to make these strong dichotomies, but a lack of experience and a strong uh, disposition to adhere to doctrine, which seems to be another tension. Um, all sorts of tensions seem to come, you know, e even, even fighting styles of aggressive versus more cautious or conservative. These various tensions seem to, to come together in Buckner. Is, he, uh, how, is there a final evaluation you offer of Buckner? In some ways, he seems a larger-than-life figure, very debonair, and um, you know, many people seem to revere him. Uh, at the same time, there seem to be lots of human foibles. What do, what do we do with Buckner? Yeah, it's a good question, Mark. I mean, I, I was very conflicted about Buckner because as you say, he's a very likable character. He, he produced great loyalty among his personal right. staff. I think the soldiers who served under him liked him. He was larger than life, he's incredibly fit, but he was inexperienced. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of that inexperience, he, he wasn't able to call on any uh, stuff in the past that he'd done right or wrong that could inform him. And it made him on the one hand, as you've already quite rightly pointed out, stick to existing doctrine, which was very much to use artillery. This was you know, well known in the American army at this time that you would use artillery to work your way through difficult positions. But, but of course, uh, the war had changed a lot. The Japanese had changed their tactics in the Pacific and you needed to adapt your tactics to change with them. Artillery, as was recognized by Buckner's deputy chief of staff. And interesting enough, when you ask about tension between the different branches of the military, he had a deputy chief of staff who was Marine and also a deputy chief of staff who was Army. And I think that was very clever. And they worked well together. And Oliver Smith, who was the deputy chief of staff Marine, um, actually solved a lot of the tensions. But what Smith also said is that when Buckner made the decision, particularly in this early stage of the fighting, to effectively rely on artillery, it was a big mistake. It was never actually going to have the effect Buckner hoped it would have. And even Buckner himself admitted that in a letter to his wife when he wrote, this is the most formidable position we, we have encountered yet in the Pacific. Uh, and the only way actually to winkle the Japanese out is to go in there and burn them and, and physically remove them from these, right. these positions. Um, you know, that was not a job that artillery was going to do. And the burden ultimately was going to fall on the infantrymen. Right. Oh, that's well said. That's very good. Um, your writing, uh, and this is a compliment, your writing is grim, often exceedingly grim. Uh, you tell stories that are at times almost emotionally crippling. Uh, I had said it uh, in an earlier exchange with you that there's an old U2 song uh, called When You Look at the World, and he's probably singing it to the divine, but one of the lines or one of the verses in the song is, when there's all kinds of chaos and everyone is walking lame, you don't even blink now, do you? You don't even look away. Uh, there are different ways of telling war stories. Uh, you choose an unflinching, unblinking manner. Uh, at one point, you quote the World War II uh, Marine combat veteran Eugene Sledge, who wrote his own incredible book about Okinawa and Palelo, uh, as you know. Um, and Eugene Sledge, at one point uh, in his autobiography, writes about Okinawa that men struggled and fought and bled in an environment so degrading, I believed we had been flung into hell's own cesspool. Now, probably with this quote in mind, one of the reviewers of your book lauds your willingness to write about, as he says, the mud, the piss, and the shit, the shattered limbs, the spattered brains, the screams from mothers during the slow agony of death. Uh, 
Uh, why? When there are other ways of writing about war, why do you choose this particular way? It's, um, it's, it's a personal choice to tell war in so far as I can without having experienced it myself right. as it really is. And that is not actually interesting enough, Mark, to leave aside the other important aspects of war, which is how does it come about? Um, right. How is it organized from a macro level, you know, from a, from a grand strategic, strategic down to operational level? So all those different layers and the interactions in those layers, they're all important. And I hope I cover them to some extent. But what's always fascinated me is the human experience of war. What must it be like to be there? What effect does it have on people? How do they react to these circumstances? Do they do things good, bad, ugly, and indifferent? And of course they obviously do. And it just felt that it was, it's always felt to me vitally important that if you're, if you're going to write about war, to have that responsibility, because it is a responsibility, you need to do it in as unflinching and as an honest a manner as possible. Why does this all matter? I think it matters because far too much history, particularly academic history, is written with the use of statistics, with the, with the use of themes. It's not about the human story. And it's very right. easy for anyone to read academic history uh, and to think that there's a functionality about war, there's a, there's a lack of responsibility about launching war um, that, that you, you can fall into, you can easily fall into. So for someone to read a book like Crucible of Hell, I hope it explains how war comes about and how it, how, how it functions, but I hope it explains what it feels like to be in war and the consequences of war. It's not an anti-war book, but it's right. a book that tries to tell war as it is. And I've always felt, and I'm glad that reviewer made, that, made those points, I've always felt that's important. It's not that other historians are being dishonest. We all have our own way of doing mm -hmm. things, but mm -hmm. I don't think it gives the full picture. No, that's right. I, I, I think that's very well said. Um, you, you, you write about the grimness, but you point out it's not an anti-war book. You also write and tell stories about the Japanese without, without denying the fact that they needed to be defeated, without taking anything away from the Allies. So you, you walk these, what in other writers might be tensions. Uh, I think you walk them brilliantly. Um, a part of the grim stories that you tell, as you said, have costs, have consequences. One of those is just the, you know, the, the, the drain on the human spirit, the human soul. We know that war damages bodies, uh, but you are at pains to remind us that war damages psyches and souls and, and everything else. Why, uh, why was there so much battle trauma suffered by uh, the allies on Okinawa? Um, we would call some of this moral injury nowadays, but at least PTSD as well. Uh, what's the story behind all of that? I think the sledge quote summed it up really, didn't it? You know, the, the intensity of the fighting and the, and the conditions under which the soldiers were expected to fight. Not just the physical conditions, the sight, smell, the blood, the piss, as you, right. as you pointed out before, but also the nature of the opponent, the, 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 uh, the nature of fighting the Japanese cannot and should not be underestimated. This is a, an opponent who really is not playing by the normal rules of war. They, they had their own reasons for doing that, which I tried to explain insofar as I can in the book. But nevertheless, from, from some young guy from you know, the, the Midwest of America to go out and meet that sort of right. opponent who would not surrender, would fight to the end, would, would still try and kill even when he was wounded and he was being tended to, um, it was a brutal initiation into you know, a form of savagery that most of those young Americans were, couldn't have even imagined. And the effect that had, not only on that type of opponent, but on seeing the destruction all around them, the death, of course, of close friends, the, the heavy shell fire. One of the things that's interesting about Okinawa, as far as the island fighting of the Pacific is concerned, is that the Japanese actually had a lot of artillery. So mm. you literally had shell shock for a lot of American servicemen there. If you add all those things together, Mark, you you get a perfect storm in which something like a third of all American casualties on the island, that's a third of the 70 to 75,000 casualties, were combat or battle fatigue. Um, and that's an enormous number, and it gives you a sense of the, of the sheer intensity of the fighting. I would say, I, I, my estimate, um, having looked at all aspects of war through the ages, and particularly the Second World War, I can't think of any 
killing ground that I've studied uh, in, in, in my long years of writing history books that can compare to the Pacific War and in particular to Okinawa, apart from possibly the Eastern Front um, between the Russians and the mm -hmm. Germans. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that is some comparison, frankly. Yeah, and, it, and it is not surprising if that is the case, and I think it is the case, uh, that so many American servicemen who served in the Pacific, as opposed to the, uh, as opposed to Europe and and the Mediterranean, it would be very interesting to do a study between right. the two, actually. But I think that the Pacific was worse, and it's not surprising that so many of them came back and found it so hard to adjust to civilian life, as of course soldiers in combat always do. Yeah, right. And and just maybe to press that point a little bit further, do you happen to know? I don't. Um, I imagine a, a bulk, a majority of those, tr the, the Marines and soldiers fighting on Okinawa were already battle hardened. Um, a lot of them would have come out of Peleliu. Do, 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 do you happen to know the, the percentages of those who had previous combat experience already, and yet Okinawa was still so overwhelming? I don't know the exact percentages, but it, and it's a very good question. I think um, uh, the part of the reason why the answer to the question might surprise you in the sense that there were more inexperienced soldiers okay. on Okinawa than you might imagine was because the American military had a rotation system in place in the Pacific that meant that if you'd served three campaigns, it was three and out. There was also a time, time limit as well. Now, now, that meant that any canal veterans, if you were in the 1st Marine uh, Division, for example, they started serving at, at, at uh, uh, Guadalcanal in August 1942, and they then there then were four campaigns. So if you were a three campaign veteran from the original fighting, you were rotated back. I can't remember the exact number, but it's a significant number. Probably five to ten thousand of the Peleliu veterans were then rotated back to the states, and they had to be replaced. So you've certainly got a mixture of veterans, and and a lot of the soldiers I talk about in my story have actually seen combat. Not all of them, but a lot of them have. Yeah. So you've got a lot of veterans, but you've also got a sizable chunk of people, Mark, who have not seen action before. Yeah, that's it. Okay, that's helpful to know. That's good. You, you've touched on this already, but the the Japanese style of fighting. Uh, Japanese style of fighting, and then I would almost even ask particularly on Okinawa, and you would probably add to that Iwo Jima, uh, why did the Japanese fight the way they did? Why, why this fight to the bitter end? Uh, what's, what needs to be understood with that? I suppose you need to get into the uh, into the psyche, into the Japanese psyche, particularly the psyche of the Japanese warrior. And you know, this is this is this is not just something that was thought up in the Second World War. It's existed right. for a long time in Japanese culture that it is honourable to die in the cause of your country. They, interestingly enough, when we talk about the kamikaze, who of course play a significant role. Uh, in the Battle of Okinawa in the sense that you've got those soldiers fighting so stoically on the ground, Japanese soldiers, but you've also got a huge effort made right. by the kamikaze pilots who are literally prepared to sacrifice their lives to try and sink American ships. Why are they prepared to do that? Because it is uh, absolutely embedded into Japanese culture, uh, tradition, and even religion, that it is not a sin, as we would see it, uh, to effectively commit suicide which mm -hmm. is what they're doing. I mean, they're, they're suicide bombers. We, we struggle to understand suicide bombers today, but that, that's what the kamikaze were. Yep. They have a very different way of looking at it. Uh, they see it as self-sacrifice for a greater cause. And as soon as you get into your head that the greater cause is, one, one the country, and two, the emperor, you, you begin right. to understand their willingness to, to, to keep fighting. Now, they were ordered to do so they seem to be perfectly prepared to do so. Okinawa and Iwo Jima it probably reached its apogee because of the sheer number and the ferocity of the fighting. But this had been going on in many of the campaigns prior to this, Saipan, Peleliu, and previously, where very few prisoners of war were taken. Um, and the last thing I suppose to say about this willingness to self-sacrifice is an absolute conviction among the Japanese in two things. One, it was dishonorable to surrender. That's why they tended to treat allied prisoners of war so harshly, or at least that was the excuse. I don't think there is personally mm -hmm. any excuse, but that was the excuse. And secondly, a willingness to, to uh, sacrifice themselves because of the rewards in the future. And again, this is similar to the Islamist belief that you, know, you, you will have some kind of wonderful life in paradise. Right. They believed 
you would go to Yasukuni, which was the shrine in, um, basically become a demigod if you sacrificed yourself in combat, particularly as a kamikaze. So there were strong reasons for them to do it, um, but it was a pretty shocking experience for the right. allied servicemen to have to meet this type of threat. No, that's well, well said. In addition to the main storyline happening on Okinawa, throughout your book, uh, there's a second storyline being told. So interspersed with the chapters on the battlefield are chapters about the development, the plans for, and eventually the use of the atomic bombs. Uh, how do those two storylines intersect? You, you seem to make clear that the stories are not unrelated. Uh, I gestured earlier to, uh, to the fighting on Iwo Jima and Okinawa. There seems to be a concerted effort by the Japanese to make the fighting in those last stages so horrendous and so costly that the Allies would uh, decide not to invade the Japanese home islands, which in, a, in, in a, a grim irony, they succeeded in doing, not in ways they imagined. Uh, am, I, am I wrong to see a, a why do those storylines go together for you? Why is Okinawa also a story maybe about the atomic bomb in some ways? Um. There is a very direct connection. What's, what struck me when I uh, first looked into the basic beats of the story of the Battle of Okinawa, but even before I decided to write a book about it, one of the things that really struck me was Roosevelt's death. So he dies on the 10th of April, uh, just after the battle has begun. Truman, of course, takes over. And what struck me about that is Truman knew nothing about the development of atomic weapons. He was the vice president, as you know, Mark, the vice president isn't always the best informed in the, right. in the US political system. And they had, yeah. they had kept this top secret information from him. Of course, he had to be kept, he had to be got up to speed incredibly quickly. And in many ways, it makes his choice, it makes his moral choice even more, uh, you know, high pressured, even more extraordinary, actually, mm. because he had to get his head around the possibility of would these weapons work? And if these weapons work, can we use them? So what actually happened and how does this tie into Japanese strategy? Well, Japanese strategy in fighting the Battle of Okinawa was very much a holding action. As you've already pointed out, we're gonna try and bloody the Allies' nose so severely that they will be prepared to negotiate some kind of peace that may even leave us some of, some of our ill-gotten gains since the beginning of right. the war. That, that's, right. that's their plan. Now, we may think that's a bit optimistic, not least because the Allies had agreed you know, to insist on unconditional surrender, but that was what they thought they could get away with. The kamikaze campaign in particular was designed, um, again, optimistically, to destroy the, or at least discourage the US Fifth Fleet, leaving the ground troops that had already been landed on Okinawa to be, in the words of the Japanese, mopped up by their ground forces. Now, this again was never going to happen, and it shows you in many ways how how uh, hopelessly deluded the Japanese high command was at this point. Nevertheless, that's what they believed. And these hardliners in the Japanese high command stayed in position right up to the very end. And that is significant in terms of the decision to use nuclear weapons. So what's happening on the American side? Well, uh, Truman's been brought up to speed on the fact that they're developing them, but they don't know if they'll work. We then fast forward almost to the end of the Battle of Okinawa on the 18th of June, where a crucial meeting is held in Washington between Truman and his chief military and political advisors. And at that meeting, they discuss how they're going to bring uh, Japan to a point in which they unconditionally surrender. The plan, as Marshall, the US Army Chief of Staff, explains to Truman, is to land on the mainland of Japan in two stages in November 1945 and the spring of 1946, up to 2 million men will, will be involved. Now at this meeting, and this is the crucial point, they actually discuss the fighting on Okinawa. And it is clearly, uh, it is made clear to Truman that such was the severity of the Japanese opposition on Okinawa and the loss of life, both military and civilian, that they can expect not just more of the same, but even worse statistics when they get to Japan proper. Truman, of course, is interested in, you know, what, so what sort of estimates, and they won't give him a definite estimate for very good reasons, but he is left in no doubt that it is going to be up to a million casualties. He certainly quotes those sort of figures in the future. And it's important to remember, certainly from the British perspective, that the British are going to play quite a sizable part in, in the eventual invasion. 
So if we take the point of the 18th of June um, meeting, what is the end of that meeting? Well, having heard these horrifying statistics, Truman quite rightly asked, is there an alternative? And John McCloy, who's right. the Assistant uh, Secretary for War, says, well, of course, the alternative is to use nuclear weapons. We don't know if they'll work, but if they do, and they're gonna be tested soon, my advice and the advice of his scientific advisory group is to use them, right. to use them and hope that this will force the Japanese to see sense. That, of course, John, is exactly what happens. Uh, they uh, test it, it works, by which time Truman's out in, in Berlin at the Potsdam Conference. He receives the information, he tells Churchill, he also tells Stalin, who's pretty shaken right. by the news. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but in concert with, with Churchill, they agree to issue a final ultimatum, the so-called Potsdam ultimatum. Mm -hmm. It's rejected by the Japanese and the two uh, weapons are dropped on the 6th and the 9th on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as we know, and just a few days after that, the Japanese begin negotiations that lead to their unconditional surrender. And the only concession that's given to the Japanese by the Allies, probably a sensible one in the short term, I'm not so sure in the long term, is to allow them to keep their emperor. Okay, very good. Uh, so much there to drill down on. What, what, one, of the, one of the observations that I wanna make, which I think is crucial, is you, you get the sequence you put the sequence in a manner that we don't often see the sequence. People will often approach the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and look at it and say, oh, this was a terrible thing to do. How could we have done it? What were the alternatives? When in fact, the history is looking at the grim prognosis of an island invasion and asking, you know, what on earth can deliver us from this option? And then you turn and you see the atomic bomb as an option, and that must have seemed something of a gift from heaven uh, for so many of the people involved. However grim, however horrible it was, um, it seems in all likelihood infinitely less horrible than any viable alternative, whether a naval blockade, a land invasion, uh, on and on. And as you touch on, it's not simply allied lives lost, it's Japanese military lives and it's Japanese civilian lives. On Okinawa, um, this is a little bit of, of a hypothetical, but on Okinawa, you, you, you point out how the Japanese conscripted Okinawan civilians. There was the, the blood and iron student corps uh, and various, various ways that they, they brought the civilians into the fight. Uh, we understand that the same thing was being planned on the Japanese home islands, where it was a, a, something of a universal conscription. If you could fight, you would fight. Um, what, do you, what do you make of the civilian willingness to fight on Okinawa? Did the civilians uh, throw themselves into the battle? As a historian projecting into something that never happened, would the civilians have been a part of the fight on the Japanese home islands? I was quite shocked actually at the, uh, the, the willingness, as it were, of the Okinawans to assist with the, with the, uh, the military struggle um, hmm. in Okinawa. Now, there are two ways to look at this. The long view, of course, is that the Okinawans are very much blame the Japanese for a, a, the loss of life and, and have said, you know, we, we were treated as second class citizens. That's the history we're taught now. I know that there's still tension between the, the uh, American bases on Okinawa, but the Okinawans in, in, during the Second World War and from sources I saw were very pro the Japanese war effort until things started to get very nasty. Mm -hmm. Now, did everyone willingly serve the Japanese in terms of helping with the war effort, helping to dig those trenches, helping as nurses? No, I wouldn't say willingly, right. but enough of them were, were prepared to go along with it because they felt, believe it or not, uh, Mark, quite patriotic. Now, if mm -hmm. they felt like that on Okinawa, to answer the second part of your question, right. uh, this was going to be a serious uh, problem for any allied invasion of the Japanese home islands, not just dealing with the military, but also dealing with civilians. Now, one of the sources I found was actually the wife of a, a, a kamikaze pilot. And I've got this section in my book in which, uh, you know, she's really interested deeply in what's going to happen to him and whether, and whether he's going to survive and whether he's doing his duty for his country and all of that. But at the same time, almost as an aside, she talks about how she, working in a factory, has been trained to kill Right. American soldiers when they land on the right. beaches. Not only has she been trained to do it, she's delighted that she's been trained to do it. I mean, maybe delight is too much, a, too much of a strong word, 
she's absolutely up for it. In her mm -hmm. patriotic duty is to defend her homeland. And if she felt like that, a 20 year old girl, you can be damn sure there are an awful lot of Japanese civilians who would willingly have entered the fray and they would have died in their hundreds of thousands, if not their millions. So all of these factors, uh, Mark, you're absolutely right, need to, be, need to be brought into the equation. Only during the research and writing of the book was I, in my own mind, properly able to see the decision uh, to use nuclear weapons from what I consider to be a proper perspective in the sense that you have all the information and you begin to understand the position Truman felt himself in. You know, it's very easy today um, with the benefit of hindsight, or at least with the benefit of, of a feeling, I suppose, in modern times that the use right. of nuclear weapons is a no-no. Uh, at that time, it was very much felt, and I think not just felt, it really was the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, that's well said. We could do an entire show on that, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Maybe we can talk again later. Uh, but I, I, I hope that this, uh, this interview will be also posted um, on the website of the United States Naval Academy, uh, where in the fall I'll be going to do some work. Uh, if you knew that, this, that your book was going to be put in front of young men and women who are training to be commissioned as officers in the United States Navy or the US Marine Corps, uh, with the prospect of leading other men and women into battle sometime mm -hmm. in the future. What might you hope that your book uh, would, would give them as they prepare themselves uh, body and soul for that kind of grim responsibility? I hope it gives them a sense of this is as bad as it can get. It probably will never be as bad as this. It probably will never be as bad as this ever again, uh, Mark. Uh, but this is war in all its reality. So whatever you think, whatever you've read, whatever you imagine, this is war. This admittedly is war as bad as it can get, as I say, but this is war. And that's on the one hand, okay? So if for some potential servicemen and women, it might be a bit of a reality check, but that's no bad thing. But on the other hand, uh, while combat, and certainly Okinawa, was as bad as it could get, it was also as good as it can get. And I think all uh, combat veterans, I've spoken to many of them, I've read many diaries and accounts over, over centuries of warfare, uh, and all of them get something out of it. They get a sense of camaraderie, a sense of teamwork, a sense of togetherness, a sense of belonging, that I don't think you can compare to anything in civilian life. It, it will raise you up to those sorts of heights uh, that you can never achieve in civilian life. And that is something with all the dark side, with all the downside that's to be treasured. And, you know, and just one final thought, because most of us certainly in modern life will never be called upon to do so, but to actually do your duty in the service of your country, I think is an incredibly laudable act. We still remember those soldiers from the Second World War as certainly in America, the greatest generation. And there's a reason for that. Uh, there is a good reason for that. And I think anyone going to the military services today, I applaud them. I think they should be very proud of themselves. That's nice to hear. Sal, thank you for all your time. Thank you for the book. It's a great book. I hope it sells well, gets into a lot of people's hands. What's, what's next? What are you working on? Well, uh, it's interesting. I, you know, I'm, I'm out in the Far East, of course, um, working on the, uh, or having worked on the uh, Okinawan story and I'm currently writing at uh, the end of my story about the British Special Forces in the Second World War in Malaya. It's actually the Marine Special Forces, the SBS. So we've had previous a lot of books about the SBS in the Second World War, which is where really Special Forces, as you know, Mark, starts in, in, in terms of our, our modern understanding of the use of the term special operations. But our Marine Special Forces, the equivalent, I suppose, of, of uh, the Navy SEALs in, in right. the US, began in the Second World War, and it's an amazing story of, the book is, at least the working title is, is Silent Warriors, and that's very much how they fought, how they still fight today. They arrive unseen, quietly, do their job, and leave preferably without causing too much mayhem while they're still on the ground, if you see what I mean. And it's, a, it's mm -hmm. an amazing story about, about missions launched from canoes uh, and submarines, all over the course of the Second World War, and the final end game is in Malaya. So I'm back to the Far East, but it's really about the war in its total, both in, in, in Europe and the Far East. Oh, that's brilliant. I look forward to that. Any of those guys still with us? 
There is one particular guy still with us. Uh, not many, because you can imagine they'll be well into their 90, 90s now, but one, yeah. one man who was a member of a midget submarine team that uh, went into the D-Day beaches three days before the landings and then stayed underwater for the simple job of when D-Day actually occurred, they surfaced on the morning of D-Day and marked in the landing craft as they came into the beaches. And one of the interesting statistics I discovered, not statistics, one of the interesting facts I discovered, Mark, is that the offer was made to some of the uh, American divisions, would they like the similar sort of uh, job done for them? And they were too concerned about the possibility of giving the game away, which of course was an ever-present risk uh, before the actual landings, and they decided not to use these marking systems. And as you will know, I think you will know, one of the big problems at Omaha in particular was that a lot of the landing craft arrived at the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, they were concentrated in smaller areas and it obviously fed into the tragedy. So mm. whether the use of these markers would have made a big difference, we'll never know for sure, but it might have done. Um, and certainly where the British went in, where they used these markers, it, it seemed to work very well. Brilliant, that's, a, that's an incredible story. Again, thank you for your time. I appreciate it immensely. I wish you all the best. Yes, Mark. So, Saul David, and the book is Crucible of Hell, and I hope everybody reads it. Thanks a lot.